Hi everybody, it's Steve with Midwest Panel Builders and we're back with another video. Uh, today we're going to talk about the GTN 650 versus the GTN 750. It's been quite a hot topic lately on uh, which one should be installed. So Adam and I are going to do some demonstrations today and show you some of the pros and cons and talk about some of the things out there that people are saying uh, so that maybe it'll help you make the decision on uh, which one you should install in your aircraft. All right, so the purpose of this video today is to uh, kind of give the comparisons that we've heard and some of the bullet points we've heard between the GTN 650 and the GTN 750. Now, one thing I do want to note is that we are going to be showing you on the newest technology, the, the XI series, some of the bullet points that be, people bring up. It might be valid on, on the older GTN 650 and 750, uh, but everything that we're going to show you today is based on the XI because that's what we're installing today. Um, so some of the bullet points that we have is going to be a uh, screen size and then we've got other bullet points that fall underneath the screen size. One thing we'd like to point out the 750 is indeed bigger. It's six inches tall as opposed to like 2.69 inches for the GTN 650. Uh, one of the biggest things we'll look at is, is the size of the holes that we have to cut out. And that's going to make a big difference on whether or not we can actually fit a 750 onto a panel. In a lot of cases with today's panels, we just can't. Um, this one here is set up for a 650 with a GMC 507. And as you see, I've got a G5 up here. There's no way that I'm going to ever be able to fit a 750 in here. I have to start losing things in order for that to happen. The other thing that's going to happen is if we actually do cut a hole that's bigger, you know, this is all that is holding the equipment. So we can start to get flexing of the panel and stuff if we, A, we have too much weight and B, we start cutting out too much of this metal. So that's one thing to um, you know, consider when you're thinking about what equipment. Um, also, what's behind the panel? A lot of times people don't realize that there's pieces behind here that we have to contend with, switch sizes, things like that, that we can't just push things all over the place. So that becomes a, a really big consideration when we're thinking about which unit we're gonna use. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna have Adam uh, talk about some of the other differences. Um, you know, one, uh, one other difference is gonna be price, of course. Uh, there's about a $5,000 difference between them. But I'm gonna let Adam now show you some of the bullet points and some of our workarounds or ways that we do things that make it not such a big deal to use a 650. So as you come over to our EFA system, the first thing that uh, people would we'll say is obviously the 750 has more screen real estate. The 650 uh, is somewhere around 2.3 inches high. The 750 is around six inches high. So you're getting over double uh, the screen out of a 750 in the yard is 650. Of course, um, that's great and all. In a panel like this though, as you can see, we don't exactly have a ton of room to double the height of that unit. So that's one issue. Um, but the other issue is the amount of money that Garmin commands for a 750 over a 650 for a little extra screen space. I mean, you're basically talking in the magnitude of four grand. And there's other things that you can do before spending four grand on just a slightly taller screen. So um, all of these arguments really are gonna surround that uh, with the exception of one. So the first one is, um, we've heard a couple people say, well, but the 750 has safe taxi, but the 650 does not. Well, as you can see here, this is the Flint Airport that I've got zoomed in on the map here. And in fact, it does have safe taxi. Now all this extra item over here this is just because i'm panning around right now when you actually land it'll just zoom right in on it you won't have that extra stuff it'll be relatively decluttered but there it is there's charlie there's charlie 3 and just for comparison we also have it on the g3x so charlie and charlie 3 there so you've got a nice large screen here for safe taxi and you've also got safe taxi over here um, not an issue on the 650xi uh, the next item that uh, we've heard about is the lack of a qwerty keyboard this was true of the 650 originally. They actually did a software update on the 650 non-XI even to address this too, uh, but the 650 XI as well. Uh, the keyboard is in fact a QWERTY keyboard. So if I go to add a waypoint, there it is. Now one thing I will concede is the fact that you have to go to the one, two, three here to get your numbers. Or if you're on other data entry and you want symbols, you have to hit the one, two, three. So that is one limitation, um, but not really that big of a deal. So the final item that we're going to address is the ease of use between the 650 and 750 XIs. So 
Um, really what it's about is when I get into my aircraft and I first put my flight plan in, what does that look like? And if I'm on route and I get a reroute from ATC, what does that look like? So the first thing is you don't actually have to touch the 650 for anything if you don't want to. Um, you can do all your flight planning through here. It's actually not that bad. Uh, I've got a basic flight plan from, uh, from Lapeer to Grand Rapids here with an approach loaded. Um, but if I wanted to add an item, let's say I wanted after Grand Rapids to go to Lansing, I can just type, I got a little click happy there, K-L-A-N, and then there's my fast find for Lansing, and it just throws it right on there. If I wanted to add another one, maybe I wanted to go to uh, Jackson, or Jacksonville, excuse me, all the way down to Florida. Um, you can see it's easy just to type waypoints in. So really it's not even that big of a deal, and if you really want to go old school, you can even use this too if you're bouncing around or something and you know you're having a hard time using the, the keyboard or we come over to the G3X and we go to our flight plan page and we've already done a video on this in a little bit more depth but I'll kind of retouch again I can go to internal GPS it'll say flight plan may be modified I'll hit OK now one thing that does happen when you do this if you have an approach loaded into the GTN and you switch to internal mode here the approach or even the arrival procedure will get kicked out. This is because this is not a certified GPS, but this is. Garmin does not want you flying procedures on this unit, so keep that in mind. Um, but for basic flight planning, so you can see my waypoints in here already. So now, uh, well, let's say I wanted to delete Jacksonville, and I wanted to get rid of Lansing, and maybe I wanted to go to Mount Pleasant. There's another QWERTY keyboard with all the numbers, so it's pretty easy just to uh, KM, whoops, if I know where I'm typing, KMOP, Mount Pleasant. That's on there over on the GTN here. You can see Mount Pleasant automatically cross fills. Finally, we can come over to our iPad here, and this is what I do. I set up a flight plan well ahead of time uh, before I ever get to the airplane. So that same flight plan that I had earlier. Um, where we're going from Lapeer to Grand Rapids with an approach on a 2-6 right in Grand Rapids is already preloaded. In fact, I'm going to set this back to external GPS so that I can demonstrate this. So over on the iPad here, if I just hit this little uh, Connects button, or uh, flight, uh, ForeFlight calls it something different, but I call it Connects because that's Garmin's terminology. If I hit this button here and I hit Send to Panel, on the G3X over here, we get the request to activate this. So if I activate this flight plan, you saw the GTN automatically update. So there's my approach even. So I had Orion as my uh, initial approach fix, so it pulled everything in. So I would have this program, maybe not the approach, you may not know what approach you're doing, but let's say I just get rid of it and um, this is my route to Grand Rapids. Um, what I would do is I'd plan this out, I'd file it, and then uh, ATC would give me an expected route back. If it matches, great. If their expected route's different, I'll refile with the new expected route um, pick up my clearance in the aircraft and just push this to the panel uh, and then you're done. It's as easy as that. Maybe you push it to the panel first before you pick up your clearance but it doesn't really matter. It's there. Um, and then let's say you get an on route change. So let me uh, just make sure that's pushed. Okay. So I get an, a route change and uh, now ATC says overfly the Flint VOR after URSA. So I will go insert before Saren and I'll do the Flint VOR insert and I always look to make sure that the new route change is as expected because what I don't want to do is change it on here and have my GPS navigating me to this new waypoint if I put it in wrong. So I'm happy with it now send it to the panel hit activate it's as easy as that. Again I didn't have to touch the GTN at all let's load an approach procedure approach procedure uh, again I'm going to do the RNAV into 26 right Orion is going to be my initial approach fix. I'm going to do the LPV and I'm going to hit add to route. Now push it to the panel, activate it, and my approach will be ready for me when I get there. All I have to do now is on the GTN, if I'm flying on the map page and um, I'm getting ready to do the approach, I'll go home, procedure, and I'll activate my approach. And that will tell the GTN to start sequencing me for it. That's all you have to do. If you didn't have your iPad, and you had to put an approach in, you do have to do it on the GTN. So I'll select a different one. We'll go to the 26 left, and my transition I'll set up as Unsum.
and then I can load approach or load approach and activate. If you're still a ways out and you haven't been cleared for the approach, this is what you want to hit. If you have been cleared for the approach, this is what you want to hit. So I'll hit load for now, and now it's ready to go. There's the rest of my flight plan, and you can even see over here on the iPad, it's asked me if I want to load this new route from the panel. So I'll hit yes, and now it's prepared me for the 2-6 left RNAV approach. So you can see it's pretty easy to use this stuff. You don't have to do a whole lot of digging through menus or anything, especially with the use of an iPad. Uh, but not everybody wants to fly with these, and so even without that, um, most everything that you want to do can be done here. And then when it's time to do an arrival and approach, hit the three or four buttons to uh, load it into the GTN. It's pretty easy to do. So a couple more items to touch on real quick. Uh, the first one that we've heard a couple of times is, well, what if I wanted to control my audio panel through the 750? So the GTN 700 series is the only GTN units that can control an audio panel on it. It uses the GMA 35C. In a case where we have EFIS like G3X, it doesn't really make sense to do that. Um, if you have another aircraft like a 182 that has a couple of G5s uh, like iFly, um, yeah, it makes sense to have the audio panel of the GTN. But the thing is, is on a G3X aircraft, particularly one with two displays, one, not only is the control right in front of you, but you have two points of entry. Uh, with the GTN, you only have one point of entry. So if something were to go wrong, um, you're kind of hindering yourself in reversionary capability a little bit. Um, and again, the price between the experimental audio panel and the certified audio panel, it really doesn't make a whole lot of sense to do that. The, the certified audio panel doesn't do anything more. Um, also, you know, of course, again, back to the whole larger screen thing, well, what if I want another MFD in my aircraft? So if your concern is screen real estate, before you spend an extra four or $5,000 in one of these, get another one of these. You're getting a lot more value for your dollar and you're getting a lot more backup capability in your aircraft as well, since you have all your engine instrumentation over here and you have um, you know, an extra way to control your comm radios and your audio panel and transponder, all that stuff. All right, so uh, it was a great presentation by Adam um, to show some of the differences with the 650, 750. Uh, if you're in a steam gauge airplane, like a 182 that we happen to fly that has G5s and then the rest of it's just regular steam gauges, it makes all the sense in the world to have a 750 in there. And I would recommend it because that becomes your only point of entry for data and for your maps and things like that. So all day long on these um, panels, like for the Sling TSIs and, uh, and really any of the Sling or, or the experimental aircraft, we are very limited by space. And that becomes a premium when you're talking more than double the size for a 750 versus a 650, it really becomes a challenge trying to uh, pack these in here. And it comes down to what I always say, just it, even if we can, should we? Because we start to uh, hurt the integrity of the panels and things like that. So I really hope that this uh, has helped you out in making that decision. If you have uh, any other concerns that we may not have addressed, uh, please leave them in the comments. Um, if it's an easy one, we'll reply to you. If it's one that's a little more complicated, we'll make a whole video on it. This is how we get video ideas. Um, please consider subscribing for more videos like this that we hope are informative uh, for our customers out there and for our watchers. Uh, also, please like this video. It helps YouTube recommend it to pilots like yourself. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.